Research Department and directs product development and strategy for the Fixed Income Group. He also sits on the bank's economic research team. Eric, thank you so much for joining us today, and I will kick it over to you. Great. Uh, we'll get this rolling. Of course, we need to start with a quick uh, disclaimer statement. So maybe later on, you can uh, take a moment to read through this. Clearly, we're here for informational purposes only. We're not trying to give investment advice or recommending that you buy or sell anything, but we're glad you're here today. Uh, we're going to talk about what we see happening with the economy and where we think we're headed during this uh, incredible, truly incredible time that we're all going through. And this first chart shows us what we all know has happened. On the right-hand side of the chart, you see we had this terrible um, COVID recession that occurred. And in the first quarter and second quarter of the year, we actually published, I believe it was minus 32 and change on the GDP growth rate for the third quarter. And more importantly, where are we headed? Um, that's what's on the very right-hand side, these two red bars. This number's getting um, modified pretty quickly every day, but we're headed for a large rebound GDP growth rates for the third quarter, which is the first red bar on the right, and the fourth quarter on the far right, are definitely gonna be strong numbers. We're looking at double-digit numbers for the third and fourth quarter. Our first estimate, we published this slide deck about three or four weeks ago, and we were looking at probably a 14 or 15% GDP growth rate in the third quarter. And again, double digits uh, for the fourth quarter. Um, it's, it's looking like we're on the road to recovery. We're certainly not all the way back to where we used to be though. And the next slide is gonna illustrate for us exactly what I'm talking about there. Um, this is the actual GDP activity, the, all the economic activity of our entire economy. That's what this top line is. Um, and this represents um, billions of dollars. So over here in the left blue circle, that's $19.2 trillion. That's where we were in December before all this happened. And in the big red box, we had the big second quarter uh, meltdown, down 32%. And we're headed for some double digit recovery quarters for sure. That doesn't mean we're back to normal because these are quarter over quarter change rates. So we're coming out of this very large hole we're going to post some big quarterly numbers, but as you can see, as far as the actual economic activity level, we are probably going to be out in the middle part of 2022. We just talked about it again this morning, perhaps even early 2023, before we see that 19 and a quarter trillion dollars worth of activity like where we were at the end of last year. So the recovery is in place, but it's going to be a long, long trip out of here. And Eric, as we look at the, these numbers, uh, here we are sitting in mid-September. How are we pacing against the UMB forecast of 14% for the third quarter of 2020? A great question. Um, we just revised some of these numbers, actually, to your point. Um, the third quarter is coming in much stronger than we expected three or four or five weeks ago. Um, most analysts, now I'll tell you this, it's a broad range. It's a very, very broad range. Um, the Atlanta Fed says 35% is what they're seeing for the third quarter growth rate. Now, that's by far the highest. The average of all of the folks that we see that as far as a consensus would be concerned, most of the consensus now is probably in the 22, 23, 24% range for the third quarter. But then that simply means the fourth quarter is going to be lower than this 12% number. Um, it's looking like we're going to be maybe even 23 for the third quarter and maybe five or six for the fourth quarter. So the, re the rebound has happened. It's happened pretty quickly in the third quarter. Um, that'll soften up the fourth quarter a little bit. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think it fits with what we've seen at C2FO where we have seen the loaded accounts payable on our system rebound relatively quickly back to pre-COVID levels. And in fact, pacing to be about two to $2.2 .2 trillion on an annual basis right now of matched AP and AR. So it's good to see the recovery very real time happening here in the back half of the year. Though yeah, you, you, you guys are in a, in, in a unique situation where you're probably back to 2019 quicker than most. Uh, for the year, all those numbers, when you cook them all together, it's going to probably mean like a minus 4%, minus 5% year. And then we'll get back on track to some lowish normal number. And then uh, C2FO is going to probably beat everybody there, but the rest of us aren't going to be back to normal, normal till probably late 2022. Um, 
the next few slides are some of the things that everyone on the phone is probably well aware of. I mean, we know what happened with unemployment. It was a very typical response this time. Um, very big spike in the unemployment rate. No matter how you measure it, we got up into the mid-teens. And now, at least as of August, the unemployment rate has dropped down to 8.4, a pretty rapid drop. Um, we do not believe that the unemployment rate is getting back to where it was, um, that wonderful three and a half or four percent unemployment rate, we think we're going to settle down probably closer to six percent unemployment with a higher average long-term unemployment rate as we move on into 20, late 21 and early 2022. It's, it's not going to be exactly the same. Um, one of the challenges we have, these three bullet points came out, oh, it was a few weeks back, but the, essentially the BLS who is in charge of the unemployment rate number, it's their number, they're acknowledging that there's a lot of uncertainty around it right now. It could be as much as 3% higher than what's indicated, according to them. One of the challenges is they have very low response rates, only about 65% response rates where they're normally at 85. A bit of a mystery because it's not like people have a lot of other things to do. So they're not sure why that response rate is so low. Um, Zero Hedge, which is a, an industry uh, research uh, publication, published a while back that there were 19 and a quarter million people getting unemployment insurance, but there were actually at that moment in time only 17.7 million listed as unemployed by the BLS. So the speed with which it all happened and the speed with which all the benefit programs came out, it's clouded the numbers for sure. We don't know exactly what the unemployment rate is right now, but it is getting better. We're going in the right direction. Um, this next slide tells us one of the interesting differences and challenges this time on the top side and the green, uh, the green lines here, are the typical movement of unemployment when we go into a recession, which is these vertical gray bars or recessions. When we go into a recession, um, these are the people that report themselves as permanently unemployed. Um, and typically when we have a recession, people lose their job. They say, yeah, I've lost my job. I have to find a different job. This is permanent. That's normally what happens is everyone believes they've permanently lost their job. This time, because of the nature of it, when this is the temporarily unemployed, this blue line, and it usually doesn't go up that much during a recession. Um, this time on the right-hand side, this current recession, you can see it's hard to see because everything is so vertical. Um, this massive spike in unemployment was almost all people that report themselves as being temporarily unemployed. That's because of the nature of the Fed programs, um, the PPP programs, and, and the payroll preservation things that were happening. Virtually everybody that lost their job believed it was a temporary situation. This never happened before in this country. 80% of the unemployed believe they were getting their same job back. That has dropped pretty dramatically uh, over the last couple of months as we see how this recovery takes place and it's not gonna be a rapid recovery back to normal. That number's dropped now down to 45%, you can see, believe they're gonna get the same job back, that they're just temporarily unemployed. So it's dropped way off but it's still much, much higher than anything we've ever seen in the past. So even though it's tapering off, there's still a lot more optimism about the nature of people's unemployment. A lot of folks still think they're getting that same job back. And sector-wise, where are we seeing the, the deepest cuts right now? I think we all know service and hospitality has been um, hit really hard. Is that continuing to be the case in the unemployment yeah. numbers now? By far, you know, uh, manufacturing got hit, but a lot of those people didn't hit the unemployment lines or the unemployment rolls, but it definitely hit hard on services. And that's the group that rapid drop off. That's the group that very quickly is figuring out things may not ever be the same as they used to be in the service and hospitality world. Um, things may have indeed permanently changed, so they're probably not all getting their jobs back. Now, that's also the area where we had the biggest increase in employment those last couple of years when the unemployment rate was dropping to those unbelievably low numbers, you know, from five and a half to five to four and a half to four to, to areas we didn't think we'd ever get to. Um, a lot of that growth on the tail end was services related. And so it was natural that, that with the type of hit we took, those were the first jobs that went out. They're probably not all coming back. So we, we definitely have to work through that on the long term. Um, everybody knows what's happening with COVID. Um, I'm certainly not projecting, and the bank doesn't project to be experts on COVID itself. We try to just present the best facts we have. I, it looks reasonably encouraging. We all know what happened in those hot zones, uh, Florida, Texas, Arizona, 
when they tried to reopen, cases spiked, but the cases have started to drop back off. And so that, that's good. Um, more importantly, this red line, the death rates are not, not accelerating, even when, come, when places have accelerating cases, the death rates are not accelerating nearly as quickly. So it is encouraging that perhaps the whole COVID thing is, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the, this is the chart that we like best, and it's, it's a nice consolidated chart for the country, and then the hot areas, Texas, Arizona, and Florida. Hospitaliza new cases first and foremost in black, and then hospitalizations and deaths. All three of those variables are rolling over in all of our hottest zones right now. So it looks like we're pulling through it in the vaccine, three months out, six months out, that would be the final um, recovery from this thing that gets us truly maybe back to normal, but at least we're going in a good, healthy direction. Um, it is helping confidence. Uh, we like to track confidence because it's a hugely important variable in the United States, um, especially this top line, consumer confidence. We are a 70% consumption-based economy. 70% um, of, of everything that happens is based on consumer consumption. So this top line is very, very important. Um, it did not take nearly as much a hit like many things. It didn't go down. We didn't have as much damage as we normally would during a recession. You see what happened in the last recession. Um, consumer confidence did not go down that far, and there's reasons for that that we'll talk about in a second. Um, yeah, I think consumer confidence. Go ahead. Yeah, that's just so counterintuitive, given that we talk about the current recession as the Main Street recession and the 0809 recession as the Wall Street recession but I know we'll get to that in a in a minute yeah it is it's uh, it is a little different and there's some pretty uh, stark information as to why that's happened we'll cover it it's but these confidence numbers are actually um, somewhat encouraging it didn't fall as far for consumers we've had some fits and starts but it's hanging in there at a relatively high level for a recession um, in the middle is business owners this is small business which is very important the main jobs engine in the country is small business again, didn't drop nearly as far. Uh, and it's had actually a nice rebound just in the last few months. So small business owners are feeling all right. And CEO confidence is very, very large business. This, this is Fortune 500, big, big, big publicly traded companies. Their confidence was, was waning well before uh, this crisis because of the um, trade war, the trade tariff war. The, this is the large businesses that are 30, 40% exposed to international trade. So their confidence was hurting coming into this. And you can see as the recession unfolded, uh, it really hasn't been damaged and it's been peaking back up. So confidence is looking okay uh, going forward. Um, here's the big reason we're getting into the, go ahead. Eric, I think it's interesting for us here at C2FO, if we can go back a slide, as we think about the small business optimism index and you know things that we saw as um, the economy shut down, uh, in COVID was the need for some short-term liquidity boosts. And we saw record registrations, record new participations, over 100,000 participations per month in both March and April. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, there was that drop in confidence and then the uplift, which I assume has to be partially related to government stimulus and the PPP plan. Yeah, there's there's no question that the the boost were there was was probably due to the PPP plan and and just the magnitude mm -hmm. of the government stimulus as it kept rolling out in in numbers that none of us have ever spent any time talking about in trillions of dollars um, that the, the magnitude of the stimulus which we'll talk about it gave everybody some hope that we weren't going to go right into a, a crisis like the last one in 2008 where we have defaults rolling through the system. You know, where we have credit defaults for C2FO or for banks or anywhere else, that's when it becomes toxic because when the financial intermediaries start to get fearful of a default wave, we start to shut down credit. And when that starts to happen, it can rapidly really shut down the economy. And so um, the government dropping several trillion in to keep uh, most of us confident that things are going to work, it was critical to keep things clicking. And it really helped small businesses feel like. Uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So magnitude, we're going to talk about in a minute, but it probably was the right thing to do, at least at the time when they initiated it. Um, this next slide tells the story of personal, of, of the previous slide, this consumer confidence, uh, really hanging in there quite well. 
everyone probably knows why that is. Uh, Carrie touched on it. Um, on the bottom is a chart of personal income. Uh, those are the average consumers, what we're talking about, personal income. And this is what it would look like in a normal recession. You hit the recession, jobs are lost, payroll, uh, pay is frozen for those that keep their jobs, and personal incomes in aggregate go down. This is what a normal recession would look like. That's what it would have been without the fiscal stimulus programs that Carrie mentioned. This is what actually happened here on the top, this blue line. And you may have seen this elsewhere. This is the first time in history that personal incomes in aggregate for the whole country are up during a recession. With all the fiscal stimulus programs and the money that was literally handed out, personal incomes went up. The average person on unemployment benefits, I'm sure you all knew, had 135% of their working wages coming in, in unemployment. Um, so it actually it created a bump in personal income, kept confidence up, that, that helped keep things uh, from going into a real broad scale long-term crisis. Um, this is the, just the waterfall of all the different things, a lot of different programs. And uh, I won't try to read you the names of all the different forms of stimulus that were introduced and they added up to trillions of dollars. All of these are being debated as we speak hotly, hotly debated, is Congress going to roll the stimulus over? Um, that's kind of a daily question. Uh, we came to a conclusion this morning for the first time in our strategy group. We think that there is a reasonable chance that they are not going to roll everything over before the election. It seemed as though it was an absolute certainty that heading into election, they simply had to roll it over or they would uh, destroy their election prospects but it looks like they might be able to use it as a political tool um, on and through the election. And so we think there's at least a reasonable chance, call it at least a 40 or 50 percent chance that these do not get rolled over in front of the election. Um, and it may be postponed until after, which will cause even more turbulence for everybody around election time. So if we're waiting for the election, what's your prediction around whether this is going to be consumer focused? stimulus or business-focused stimulus? Best guess would be that it will be consumer-focused again. Um, they're not going to roll over the magnitude, um, like we just said, every, it became very widely known that the average unemployed person had 135% of their income. That's not going to happen again, but some version of that is likely to be reintroduced. Um, what we hear that seems most rational in the analysis that I've seen at least is probably perhaps another round of just direct stimulus checks and certainly the additional unemployment benefits, but at a much lower magnitude, probably only 55 or 60% of what they were before, so that they get close to simply replacing the working income to at least have there be some incentive to get back to work. So it'll probably mostly consumer focused uh, going forward. In the first round after the election, there is still a possibility of more than just one more round. We've got to get through the election first, though. We all know the story on this page of the challenge we all have. Most folks don't want to do any of what are called now considered high-risk activities, you know, cruises and airplanes and casinos, uh, sports events, uh, something most of us really miss a lot. That's a problem. Harris Poll tells us folks are still a long ways away from wanting to do that. And the asterisk on all this would be asterisk or there is a vaccine. If we get a vaccine, a lot of this stuff at the top here could heal much, much quicker. And that's the whole hospitality industry Carrie was talking about. Perhaps we get back whenever there's a vaccine. Most folks don't wanna talk about doing it, uh, even at the current time, not to, for probably four to six months on the quote unquote high risk um, activities. Now we'll get into uh, sort of the meat of some of the data where um, I guess some people start to get a little hot under the collar about some of the things that are going on possibly. And we try to ask, answer the question, on this slide, is the, is the federal stimulus package, what has been done, did they do the right thing? Was it the right place to start? Um, magnitude is probably a second question. Is it the right magnitude or not? And is it the right thing or not? We'll, we'll try to address it. Um, this is a spectrum of things that the federal government can do. If they're gonna go into a deficit and do deficit spending, or spend money they don't have and increase our debt, what else can they do with it? And what is the potential impact of, of all the different things they can do? And that's what this chart tries to tell us. And these are the different buckets of activities. 
And they actually calculate a thing called the multiplier effect. And this, is a, this is a graph of the possible multiplier impact. If the Fed does a deficit, deficit spends $1, does it result in $1 of economic activity or 50 cents of economic activity or $2 of economic activity? Obviously, we want very high multiplier effects. That's what we want. These are all the different things they can do. Any of them can have very bad multiplier effects if they're poorly executed. There's no guarantee that they're, they're, they're going to have a one or better multiplier. Anything can be poorly executed. Um, some folks don't like uh, the way some of this data stacks up because on the right-hand side are tax cuts. Typically considered to be the least impactful as far as multiplier effects are concerned, um, especially when they talk about corporate and high-income earner tax cuts. Uh, high income earners have a low propensity to spend. A lot of times this just turns into additional savings. Um, tax cuts for the low and middle class tend to have a little bit better, but still one or less. But lower income folks tend to spend the money that they save on taxes. At least a portion of it goes out into the economy. On the left hand side is the best thing that the government can do. If they're going to have a deficit, if they're going to spend deficit dollars and dig a hole, what we want them to do is infrastructure spending. That's what's on the left-hand side. Or these two buckets are just two different um, categories of infrastructure spending. By far the most impactful multiplier the government can get. The challenge is these take by far the longest time, um, especially with a divided, uh, I guess, society with so much divisiveness in DC that we have right now. Deciding what to do takes a very long time and implementing the plans and your infrastructure, you're talking about bridges, roads, dams, reservoirs, uh, big things like that. It takes a very, very long time. So we wish they would focus their, their de deficit dollars over here in the middle of a surprise crisis. Um, transfer payments to individuals, like we just talked about. $1,200 checks in the mail, um, $600 uh, bonus checks for unemployment, increased bonus uh, unemployment benefits. This is by far the fastest impact of anything they can do. It has an almost immediate impact on economic activity, and it typically has more than a one-to-one -one multiplier. So it was probably the right place to start. If you had a crisis like we had that was completely shocking and unpredicted, and you need a very, very quick fix, this is a good place to start. They started in the three to five trillion dollar range. There are people saying they're going to get to 10 trillion if they can ever uh, come together on that. It's looking less likely that they're going to get something this year. But the magnitude uh, gives some folks heartburn, but it probably was a good place to start. We, we want to see them come over here to the left. If they're going to continue to spend deficit dollars, we wish it would be over here, but they probably at least started in the right spot. Yeah, it's interesting. I was looking at some of the survey results uh, around the stimulus checks that went out in April, and it appeared that about 50% of people said that they had gone straight to savings. Others were using them to pay mortgage and rents at about a 25% rate, and then 25% were using for discretionary spend. But you're right. I mean, at least it gets the dollar circulating. I think interestingly for us at C2FO is we uh, see, you know, 95% of the participants in our markets being small businesses. There's still a liquidity crunch for many of them as the, uh, the just the systemic challenges of getting cash and even struggling with the PPP programs, especially minority owned businesses. And minority owned businesses within our marketplace participate 1.6 times more than non minority owned. And I really do think that it's a reflection of uh, difficulties with the systemic nature of our financial system. Yeah. But it's good to see, you know, that the, the government reaction to some extent. Now we'll talk a little bit later about what that does to inflation. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I think. We needed to do something without it out. Yeah, the, the reaction was quick and it needed to be quick. It needed to be probably in the area they're in. Magnitude, it does bring up, as you said, some of the other questions uh, that we'll, we'll hit in a minute. If, if the trillions keep stacking up, there's going to be some long-term questions. Um, what they did accomplish, and you just touched on it for the average consumer, not the, necessarily the average small business, but delinquency rates are actually lower than they were a year ago. 
Now, if you replace all the unemployed people's income and then some, it makes sense that for the first time in history, we're, uh, we're in the midst of a shocking and really deep uh, recovery from recession and delinquencies are down, not up. So again, it kept that financial crisis from developing. By, by preventing delinquencies, it really helped avoid the real teeth of an ugly recession. We, we managed to, to, at least for the time being, um, cause that to not happen. I don't know if it's permanently postponed, but... Yeah. I, that slide concerns me a little bit because a couple slides earlier, you were looking at the mortgage uh, forbearance expiration, which is at the end of October. Mm -hmm. We talk about not having another set of stimulus uh, approved before the election. And it does make you wonder where those rates go in the fourth quarter in the first half of next year. That's what's so challenging about uh, if, if our friends in DC decide um, that they can't decide. And th there's, no, there's no question that as the forbearance programs roll off, you're then going to have delinquency problems and you're going to unleash this other really ugly conversation. And it seems difficult to imagine that they're going to knowingly do that. Um, but politics being what they are, it's being used as a, as a kickball right now. But I guess shame on them if they knowingly decide to allow all these delinquencies to happen. That's that that would be an unfortunate decision. But there's a lot of forbearance out there. To your point, that will turn turn into delinquencies if something uh, isn't rolled over. Um, and the in the the topic of magnitude, um, we try to just at least illustrate that uh, it's not something that just the crazy U.S. is doing. This is a global game that's going on right now. The dark bar um, shows the amount of deficit spending, and it's the, the country's deficit relative to their GDP. That's how countries are measured. Everything is percent of GDP. So deficit as a percent of GDP. All of the major trading partners are in on it. Everyone is using a fairly large deficit this year to try to deal with this COVID thing. The United States, uh, over here on the left-hand side, as you can see, is above everybody else. We're, for the highest level we've ever had, we're at around a 16% deficit of percent of GDP. If uh, they roll out another few trillion, we could easily hit 20% deficit. I don't know if that'll happen this year because of politics, but we're definitely winning the uh, deficit Olympics. I gave the United States a gold medal here. Um, everyone's in on it, but we're certainly have the pedal to the metal as much as anybody else in the world. Yeah. And as I looked at this chart and I thought about our personal, um, global footprint here at C2FO. I know we may have some Indian-based associates and customers who uh, watch this webinar in the days to come. And I wanted to highlight that while not on this chart, they are sitting right there with Italy and China at around 7% fiscal stimulus as a percent of GDP with a number of programs that have been launched in country. Everyone's had to do it. And so it's just the game that, that we have to play right now. And the question is, when do we dial it back? And that, that could be a while. Um, on the question of the United States, uh, for all of us that are US citizens and, and going into election, the, because of the size of our country, our GDP of our country is so much higher. It looks like we're kind of neck and neck with some other folks. But when you just look at actual dollars, how many deficit dollars, what is the size of our deficit spending? relative to the rest of the world. This is uh, us because we are so large relative to the rest of the world with what we have and what is proposed. We are likely to have more deficit spending than the entire rest of the world combined. Everybody else combined together is probably gonna be less than the amount of deficit spending that we do as a percent of world GDP. So gigantic gold medal to the United States. Um, I think the world kind of expects us to do that. Um, we, we're kind of the leading economy in the world. And so folks definitely want to see us recover because as we go, typically the rest of the world goes, but we're getting into gigantic numbers that no one ever would have even, we would have been laughed out of the room if we would have suggested something like this two years ago, but, but here we are. Um, and Eric, we, have, we do have a question um, that has come into the chat room around that level of deficit spending and assuming that we have a recovery in the next 12 months, what do you think this means for inflation two to three years out? And I don't know if you'd rather address it now or if you'd like to address it in a few slides. That was the most perfectly timed question in the history of the world because it's in the next few slides. It's Yeah, when we get to this level of deficit spending, um, it automatically unleashes 
questions about, um, about what's gonna happen with inflation. It's a sort of a natural fundamental economic relationship between the two, so we have to answer that. And we'll try to illustrate why that question gets asked and, and why people are worried about it in the next couple of slides. Um, the way it's been done when the Fed simply, you, you've all heard the term prints money, when they simply send money out to people, um, it causes a rapid increase in the money supply. When they drop rates to zero and print a lot of extra money and send it out, the money supply expands rapidly. And that's what this orange line is. This is the growth rate of our money supply. And typically, uh, 5 to 10% is normal, and 15% is a very, very high growth rate of our money supply in times of crisis. And you can see on the right-hand side of the chart, the money supply growth rate has been pumped up to a 30% year-over-year growth rate, unlike anything we've ever seen before. Like all the other numbers, these are all just blowout numbers. The white line is, uh, and Carrie touched on it before with some of the surveys she was reading, the white line is what's happening to all that money. And this is the savings rate. This is the personal savings rate. Um, those transfers to individuals occurred, but at the beginning of all this, there was nothing for anybody to do with the money. There was nowhere to go and nothing to do. So people stayed current on their uh, debt and they put a lot into savings. So the savings rate grew up to 30% also. Another unprecedented number we've seen, never seen before. Now, the savings rate is dropping back down as the economy opens, uh, which is natural. As, the, as that opens, people will start to spend more and more of it, and that's good. That's exactly what we want to see. But when the money supply explodes up at this kind of a year-over-year -year growth rate, it ignites the inflation conversation, and this chart will hopefully show everybody why. This is that same money supply growth line. I've just expanded it out. There's the 30%. We just go back further in time. And if we look at periods of time when coming out of a recession, the, the Fed deliberately expanded the money supply by more than 10%. We're at 30. But if we just look at a 10% expansion rate, you can see this is the 07, 08 recession. Um, this is in late 97, 98 it occurred. And when the Fed um, it lets the money supply expand at that rate, this is what has typically happened to the inflation rate. And this is just CPI, the red line. Uh, in the 90s, we got above 10% and inflation, this is a left scale for inflation, the red line, went from one and a half to 3.7. Um, in the middle of the last uh, decade, I'm sorry, two decades ago, uh, it grew above 10% and inflation went from 2% to 5.5%. When those kind of things happen, that means the Fed has to raise rates. So over here on the right-hand side, we now have this 30% increase in the money supply, and uh, this could be updated a little bit. Inflation is running at about one, one and a quarter, but it's still way down here. Um, we haven't seen the movement yet, but we automatically have to have the conversation because of historically how things work in the United States. There are some secular forces in play right now that means that this inflation number is not going to spike immediately. Um, there, there's a lot of disinflationary forces in place right now, but um, over the long term, we're in the camp that we think that this is a story of probably three to five years out. The next couple of years, which is how we all run our businesses really, is over the next couple of years. That inflation story is not going to be a problem. The Fed has told us they do not see it being a problem, and they think they'll be able to leave rates on hold for the next two to three years. We believe somewhere out there in that three to five year zone, that's when this inflation number is gonna rise. And if it gets much up above the 2% number for very long, that's when the Fed will have to act. But it's not gonna be a gigantic spike that becomes a runaway problem that crushes everything. It's gonna probably be a slow grinding problem in 24, 25, 26, something like that. So it'll be a very big discussion a few years down the road. And longer term, um, folks probably know a little bit about this story too. This is all that debt that we're piling up, and it's not, uh, it's not, uh, this is total debt. This isn't our deficit. This is total debt that we've accumulated. Now it's 22, 23, 24 billion dollars relative to our GDP. And you have to ask yourself how much is enough and how much is too much. And this is the long term chart. And we are cresting now. We're about set to go up to right to where that red star is and move above the previous all-time high, which was just below 120% debt to GDP, right at the heart of World War II. That's where we got to 120 previously. We're gonna be at 120 again, if not a little higher than that. It depends on how the recovery goes next year. We're certainly gonna make probably 120 or a little higher. The big, big difference though is 
coming out of World War II, we had explosive GDP growth. 20 years, the greatest 20, the golden age, they call it, the greatest 20 years in the history of the world. And that massive GDP growth shrunk the debt to GDP ratio. So our, our, we grew our way out of this debt issue. We know on the right-hand side of the chart, we're not going to grow our way out of this issue. We're not gonna unleash a bunch of explosive growth. We're gonna crawl out the other side and we're gonna have probably below average growth for the next 15 or 20 years. So our ratio is gonna stay high. And we're entering the world now where we have to learn how to live with a very high debt to GDP ratio. So it's a new problem for us. Well, and I think that, that this kind of uh, harkens to another set of data points that I was looking at. And one of the big four accounting firms had done a CFO survey of the S&P 500 and 75% of those S&P 500 CFOs believed that regardless of the outcome of the election, um, corporate tax rates would go up. And I don't know that there's other options when we see numbers that look like this. It's a fair question. I mean, we all know that the cost of the debt is not high. Um, you know, it's fairly low rates, and that's why they're so comfortable issuing so much debt right now, because obviously the cost of the debt is, is new, new debt costs 60, 70, 80 basis points. Um, but when you layer it on in trillions, it still has to be paid for. And if interest rates rise at all, the cost of that can, can grow exponentially pretty quickly. So um, unless we have explosive economic growth, which we, nobody is forecasting explosive economic growth, not broadly, there, there, there will be sectors and there'll be companies and industries that have, have great growth, but as a country, we're not gonna have it. And so it's very hard to foresee um, any way of, unless we're just gonna continue to grow our debt forever, we're gonna go to 150 and then 170 and 190. Um, if, if we're not comfortable doing that, um, tax rates almost certainly have to go up. There, there's really no way around it. Hopefully it's done in a rational manner. Um, but yeah, we should expect tax rates to go up. It's not really good news for everybody, but it is what it is. And, and this chart just shows you, as I showed you in the previous chart, um, the debt to GDP ratios, it's not us, it's the whole world. Everybody in the world is, is expanding their debt to GDP in the same fashion, not at the same pace that we are, but in the same fashion. Um, and then trying to figure out how they're gonna get through the other side. Um, have to mention, we absolutely have to mention the election. Uh, it's, it's not easy to talk about, but it wouldn't be fair if we didn't talk about it. It's going to be the biggest news of the next 60 days for sure. Um, and the best thing, we, everyone sees the polls, everyone sees that Mr. Trump is probably not ahead. Uh, it's hard for incumbents to lose. It's very hard for an incumbent to lose. It doesn't happen in this country very often. It usually only happens when we are in a recession. And interestingly enough, uh, we're not going to be in a recession anymore. We will have come out of a recession. Um, if he does lose, it'll be the first time an incumbent lost when they weren't in a recession. Uh, you can see the issue that he has though is uh, particularly on handling of, because of COVID-19, um, the numbers that he gets for his handling of it, even if that means the way he speaks about it, very high um, disapproval ratings for his handling of COVID-19, while he gets generally favorable ratings for his handling of the economy. Um, decent numbers there, but the COVID-19 thing is so front and center, and it's been so devastating to everybody, this is a really tough thing for him to overcome. Um, however, despite the fact that he may be, I don't know what the number is, six, seven, eight percent, it changes every day, behind in the polls, uh, that was the same story in 2016. Um, this is his job approval rating, and it has, just like in 2016 in the polls, his job approval rating now is climbing very, very nicely. So um, his odds are getting better right now. So we don't want to say that that means automatically that uh, Mr. Biden isn't still the most likely one to win. He probably is still at this point in time, but those numbers are changing pretty rapidly in these final days. Uh, the uh, approval rating here, and this is literally the green line is what we're focusing on. That is just literally the difference between the two on odds. It's Mr. Biden's lead relative to Mr. Trump, uh, Biden less Trump, and that is fading. It is definitely fading in these final weeks and months going into the election. So 
our best belief is that it is probably closer than the polls are talking about right now. Um, but Mr. Biden is still clearly the favorite, uh, really because of it's, it's going to be really tough for Mr. Trump to win, given what's happened in these two big swing states in the blue circle here. You all remember in 16, um, in the middle of the night, I remember my son screaming at me when we found out about Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin and Michigan were the two shocking states last time. And Mr. Trump is, is very far behind. His approval rating is very, very low in those two swing states from last time. So it doesn't look promising, although um, for Mr. Trump, it doesn't look promising, but, but uh, his, his tide is turning for sure. So it, it, it could be quite close by the time we get to election time. Eric, um, before, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead with your additional election slide. Before we move on, I wanna to go to a question that we received in the Q&A. Sure. I threw this in just, uh, um, we get asked it all the time about, especially I think this time it seems even more feverish than it was in 2016 about, um, good Lord, aren't the consequences of this election, couldn't they really, really um, disable the economy and the markets? If there's a wave that switches the entire administration the other way, won't that be terrible for the stock market? Um, those kind of questions. There's a lot of fear about it, I think, because of the media coverage right now. We just put this chart together to try to just illustrate there, there's, there's reason for optimism that neither outcome is necessarily devastating. We've had every mix of outcome, you go back to 1996 between blue and red, and that's different, um, divided uh, Congress, unified Congress, both blue and red through all these different stages. And You've had positive economic results and negative economic results, positive market movements, negative market movements through all these different combinations. And it's hard to look at market history or even economic history and say that one outcome or the other is clearly positive or negative for the economy and markets. Politically, we feel that way. Some, I guess I would say philosophically about some of the philosophical changes that might happen, but economically and market-wise, it's hard to say that there's a clear negative scenario for the election. So we're not fearful um, for the market, no matter which way it goes. What, what question did you have, Carrie? Going back to federal debt, we had a question posted from um, an audience member. Said, he says, is the current federal debt being issued only for two or three years, and they're not taking advantage of low rates for the long term? A good question. Yeah, there's a uh, the question gets asked all the time. Why in the world don't they just w borrow 100% at 30 years? Why is there even a two year auction? Why, why did I even hear that they auctioned two years this time? Why wouldn't we back up the truck? Why wouldn't we go 50 years? Why wouldn't we? Because other countries have done that. Why wouldn't we approve a 50 year government note at this point in time and lock in these rates? And it's a fair question. Um, there's not a great answer for why they don't try some, what you might call unconventional approaches to it. The, the, the Fed and the Treasury have sort of their standard way that they issue debt and they have their maturity distribution that they maintain according to their standard, I guess, rules and policies. If ever there was a time to break out and go into unconventional mode, and if you're gonna borrow another $5 trillion, absolutely make it 30 years, make it 50 years at these rates, and it would really, shelter us from the, the severity of that inflation question if it comes, um, because then our debt, the cost of our debt doesn't roll over so quickly if inflation does come. It's not being done, and I'm not hearing it even being talked about, uh, but it's a great question. If I was in charge, uh, we would definitely move it out, but I'm not gonna be in charge anytime soon. So um, getting cl close to the end of the presentation here, the stock market we are constantly asked about, it's, it's a fair question, um, lordy me, what is going on with the stock market. And this slide illustrates a little bit as to why people are asking that question. This first slide is what would a typical stock market look like after and during coming out of a recession? And everyone that's on the phone is probably remembers what happened the last time. It, it takes big moves down and then it comes up a little and then it goes down again another 10% and then it climbs out and then it's down another 20 and then it climbs out and then it forms what they call a floor and then it slowly digs its way out. And that happens over the course of like a year. And this time, everybody knows what has happened. Uh, we had a very severe sell-off and 
almost a perfect V-shaped recovery, even though the economy has not had a V-shaped recovery. And, and this is because of the magnitude of the stimulus. The, the Fed came in and kept everyone liquid. The Fed uh, kept the delinquencies from happening and it gave stock investors confidence to pile back into the stock market. And we've had just an unbelievable recovery. Now we've had a rough few days, these last few days, but it's still very much a V-shaped recovery. We think for our money that it's run very far. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's wildly overvalued, but we think it's going to be hard for the stock market to sustain much above 3,200 for a prolonged period of time. And we think we might get range bound because this recovery happens so quickly, it may cause us to be range bound for a while. That's not bad news. It just means that the, the, the rebound was very, very rapid. So we might have to go sideways for a while. Um, the next three pages are just our, uh, our official forecast document with some colored charts on the right. And I'm not going to drag everybody through all of it. But for GDP and unemployment rate and things like that, clearly we were red, which is bad. Turning yellow, we're, things are thawing. We're getting better. We're pulling out. So GDP is getting better. The unemployment picture is getting better. Payrolls are getting better. We think those trends are going to stay in place. Housing has been very, very strong. Um, so there's no complaints about housing at all. Everyone probably knows what's happened there. Um, inflation is the top part of this next page. We have it all as green, meaning the inflation is not going to take off on us yet. If inflation stays relatively steady between one and a half and two, that means the Fed will leave interest rates on hold. And that means that uh, we won't be fighting that inflation problem for a while. We don't want to fight that yet. So as long as inflation stays low, we're calling that green. It'll enable rates to stay low. Um, consumer spending and confidence also just getting better. Everything's basically just warming up and getting better. The Fed funds rate, there are some who might want to debate whether it should be this low. We're saying that it's green because the Fed is going to leave it on hold. And low interest rates tend to be generally good for the economy as long as we don't get inflation. So for the next two years, we think if rates stay where they are, Oh, that's good news. Um, the stock market we just covered, it's, it's gotten better very rapidly. We think it's yellow, though, because it's going to be hard for the stock market to rally a lot from here until we get a little more clarity in the broad economy and probably even just from the election. We think the story around the world is about the same. We're all in about the same boat. Um, lots, lots and lots of potential flies in the ointment, uh, things that could come up. And this is just a long list of them. We get a second wave of COVID. Um, how many businesses are permanently impaired? Which ones have been changed forever? We're gonna have to learn that. Um, the size of the debt, uh, the presidential election, of course, is going to be choppy. Like I said, we're confident that it's not gonna be devastating whichever way it breaks. And the United States economy will be the United States economy again and still. And so we're, we're not gonna try to get cued around the election. Um, how do we pay for all this? Huge question. That's going to be a question for us and our children and grandchildren. Um, how do we unwind this strategy, all the stimulus? Can we unwind it? Um, there's lots and lots of questions that we'll be grappling with over the next couple of years. The, the amount of uncertainty is not going to get any better, that's for sure. Carrie, do you have a question? There's another question that's been popped into the chat box. Um, are there asset classes where you do see inflation, housing, equities, or tech? And do you see inflation uh, coming soon with a democratic sweep this fall? <laughs> Political question. Um, I'm, I'm, we said uh, we I'm good. Do that. We said yeah. we do red and blue. Yeah, I don't want to, we have to be careful. Carrie and I both have to be very careful about uh, red and blue. Um, if, if there's, I'll, I'll touch this. If, if there is a democratic sweep, um, there, it, it's not unfair to say it's more likely that there might be more deficit spending. That's not unfair. I mean, they, they, they might be more likely to perhaps do more deficit spending, although the current Congress is not afraid of deficit spending, obviously. Um, there's been plenty of deficit spending under the current regime. If there was a new regime, it might be a little bit more so. So might it add to those deficit concerns for the longer term? That's fair. It might. It might. Um, Probably not dramatically so. Either side has shown willingness. So um, there doesn't seem to be anybody in, in D.C. right now particularly concerned about deficits, no matter what color seat they sit in, for sure. And there's always pockets of inflation. There's no question. At any point in time, there are always pockets. Um, one of the things that folks complain about or perhaps even worry about is 
when the Fed does this quantitative easing thing like they've done, they take rates down to zero and they start printing money. Um, the first thing that tends to happen is they cause asset inflation. Um, you could definitely argue there's some very hot pockets of housing. There's, and it seems to be spreading out. We, we all can kind of see it around us. We know it used to just be the coasts. Um, and we know there's folks leaving California, uh, a lot of folks leaving California and New York, and it looks like it's causing that, that asset inflation to move, not necessarily into the Midwest, but you know, we all know Dallas, Denver, um, insane things happening in housing in some of those places. So, and, and when, when interest rates are this low, yes, it causes asset inflation to things like real estate. We don't think there's a major real estate bubble yet though, because you have to bring in the change in value values is one thing, but then what it really comes down to is the serviceability of the debt associated with those assets. And because interest rates are so low, serviceability is, housing is very affordable. Even with the rapid change in prices, because the debt cost has come down so quickly, affordability is still good. Affordability is still average. So it doesn't look like it's caused a serious bubble yet but there will definitely be rolling bubbles, especially if there's more deficit spending and more deficit spending and more deficit spending. There'll certainly be rolling bubbles, but we don't think there's a major, major bubble yet. I'm gonna wrap up on this last slide here. Um, this is a real basic forecast slide, uh, super simple, summarizing some of the things we talked about. Uh, GDP, we know there's gonna be something like a minus 5% year this year, and we think we're gonna pull out to something that was a little bit less than what we had before. We say 1.8% for 21 and 22, a little bit lower than where we were in 19 or 20, but it'll be fine. The unemployment rate I think I already touched on, it's gonna come back down, but it's probably gonna settle in around six, maybe five and a half. We're not going back to this day of three and a half. It doesn't seem possible. Uh, we said the Fed is gonna probably be on hold, 21, probably through 22 and even into 23, the Fed, if they can, are gonna leave rates unchanged. We think, to some of the questions in the prior discussion, we think the long end might be moving up. The longer that the Fed stays on hold, the more money gets printed, the conversation around inflation is going to continue to percolate. And we think that'll start to push the longer end up a little bit. So we have long rates drifting up a little bit, but nothing dramatic. But we have them creeping a little higher over the next year, year and a half. And you'll see here the S&P 500, um, we don't have it going very much. I told you we thought it might be range bound. Uh, we have it finishing next year about where it is now. So we think it just could be choppy range bound market um, for stocks next year. And that was, I believe my last slide. Oops. We, we do have another question that's come into the Q and A. An interesting one on global climate change. And do you expect it to affect the macro picture in the next two to three years as it is beginning to make itself felt in Iowa, the Gulf Coast, and the Western U.S. fire zone this year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, climate change in the next two to three years. Um, I'm going to give you my best answer on that. My, my team doesn't have an answer that's that uh, specific. My best answer on that is not in the next two to three years. Um, the climate change issue is certainly real. Um, it appears that it's longer term. We tend to, and I don't want this to sound callous in, in, uh, on the call, the markets and the economy tend to be uh, a little bit desensitized to natural disasters. We've heard there, there's a fire in California every year. Um, there's a major tornado outbreak every year. There's floods every year and we get a little bit desensitized and there doesn't tend to be much economic or market response to that these days. It's we're probably a few years away from it becoming um, severe enough to get more attention, I guess I would have to say. So we be in the camp, it's probably not a front and center economically impactful topic in the next two to three years. 10 years for sure. I think that wraps up the questions that we've received from our audience participants. Any closing remarks from you, Eric? No, just glad to be here. I'm glad I could uh, talk to everybody. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. And it's obviously been super informative and will be interesting to talk with you again in four or five months and see where we are compared to some of these forecasts that we've laid out. Um, to all of our audience participants,
Spence, thanks for being with us today. And if you have any further questions on the content or about C2FO, please hop over to our website at c2fo.com and you can chat with us there or find our phone number there. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye.